All right, sacred families, developing the family according to God's design. This is lesson number five, Parenting 101, part two, part two. So in our last uh, lesson on parenting, I said that in uh, much the same way that God breathed life into man, remember we talked about that, man he created man, he breathed life into man, Genesis two verse seven. And then in, uh, in the Gospel of John, we read the passage where Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into the apostles. I said that as parents, we also have the obligation to breathe spiritual life into our children. We don't do it miraculously as God did it or as Jesus did it, but we follow that lead, we follow that example and we breathe life spiritual life rather, into our children. And this was done in the following way. I mentioned the first way last week. First of all, we breathe love into them. Breathe life, you know, L-I-F-E, first thing. We breathe love into them. Loving your children as God loves you. Now the idea is to mirror God's love in your parental love. And I said uh, last week that children learn about God's love at church, but they experience it through their parents. So here, you know, you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, your, all your strength. You should love your neighbor as yourself. You know, we teach them that concept here, but they experience that concept at home and primarily through their parents. And also mentioned last week that this requires time and effort, it's not easy. I mean, we have a natural inclination to love our children, that's one thing, we love them, but to breathe love into them, this takes time and this takes effort. I also said that we need to teach them how to express their love for God. Um, through prayer, through worship. You know, they, they, they might ask you, you know, Mom, why, do we, why are we going to church? Why do we have to do that? Because this is the way that we express our love for God. Because this is the way we express our obedience to God. Because this is the way we show that we believe in God. We pray, we give thanks after our meals, we obey His commands. We go to church and praise Him. Uh, I, I think that they, they fight it less if they understand it more. So today we're going to continue with this breathing life into our children using, uh, looking at the I, F and E. Second element necessary to breathe the life of God into your children. You need to breathe the image. You must establish your child's identity in God's image. So loving and caring for our children, you know, that's a kind of natural impulse for most parents, but helping them establish a godly identity is very much a matter of choice. You choose to do that. Children, you know, they need structure and discipline to enter into God's ways and take on His image, and this requires the structure and the discipline of ourselves. We've got to discipline ourselves if we're going to discipline our children, especially if we're going to create, and you know, I said breathe the image, uh, I could also say create or build the image of God within them. Um, an example, when I was a kid growing up in Quebec, Roman Catholic Quebec, um, my parents wanted me to go to Mass every Sunday. Why? Because you ought to go to Mass. Why? Well, because it says so, you ought to go to Mass. I never heard, because that's your way of showing that you love God or that you believe in God and that you want to please God. It was just, no, you got to go to Mass. Every Sunday you got to go to Mass, okay. There was only one problem. They themselves did not go. <laughs> it was do as I say, don't do as I do. And I remember as a little kid, I would go to the maybe nine o'clock, because in those days, you know, in Quebec, everybody went to Mass. You know, so they had a Mass, like it's a church service, a Mass. Uh, there was one at 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., noon. You know, there was one every hour. People would go in, there would be the mass, the ceremony, take communion, so on and so forth, and out the door, and then there'd be another group coming in, waiting. So there was a mass, every, there was a service every hour. So I'd go to the maybe nine o'clock or maybe 10 o'clock one, and I'd go, and then, uh, because it was just up the street, you know, I was a little kid, just walk up the street, the church was at the corner. And then I'd come back home, my parents would be in bed. And I would, you know, say, hey, you made me go to, you know, a little kid, nine years old, 
you made me go to mass, you know, why, why are you guys sleeping? And I remember my father saying, oh, we got up early and we went to the 8 a.m. mass and then we came home to bed. And I went, oh, okay, now I understand. <laughs> yeah, I bought that for a while till I realized they didn't get up early to go, they're, they're sleeping in, I'm the sucker, I'm the one going to mass. You know, wrong, wrong idea, obviously. By the time, of course, I was 12, I was smoking. And by the time I was 15 and 16, I was involved in all kinds of immoral behavior. By the time I was 17, I was going to nightclubs, hanging around nightclubs. Imagine, think now, 17 years old, hanging around nightclubs. You know, Solomon says that parents need to be like warriors, pointing our children like arrows towards a firm target, which is Godliness in Psalm 127, uh, four and five. Paul says, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction that comes from the Lord. So not just any discipline, not just any instruction, but the type that comes from and leads one to and into the Lord. Because all fathers, normally, any country, discipline their children. That's normal. Paul is saying, but there's a specific discipline that Christian fathers are responsible for. Uh, and that is to lead their children to one day believe in and obey the Lord. And this is done consciously in a variety of ways. For example, we need to lead by godly example. So I've said this before, my mother smoked, so I began to smoke. My father drank alcohol every day, so I began to drink alcohol. My parents went to nightclubs as their entertainment, I began to hang around nightclubs as well. Uh, you know, I, by the time I was 15 or 16, I was already six foot tall, and if I put on a suit and a tie, they didn't care. If you gave five dollars to the doorman, those, those back in the 60s, you know, no, they didn't. They didn't raid nightclubs to kick out minors in those days. And if you didn't cause any trouble, you could go in and drink and you know, do whatever you wanted to do. So as you pursue a godly image, your children will follow. Now they can get the theory about godliness from Sunday school and Christian camp and so on and so forth, but they learn the practical side of godly living from watching you. I've said this before, children do not do what you say, they do what you do because that's what speaks loudly to them. Uh, another way to breathe that godly image into your child, establish godly traditions. It's amazing to note that while they were in the desert, the Jews' entire life experience revolved around their worship of God. I mean, <laughs> I know that it gets sometimes a little tedious reading through, uh, not Genesis, Genesis is a great narrative. You know, there's all those great stories about the patriarchs in Genesis. But when you get to Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, you know, it gets a little repetitious because you know, Moses is you know, uh, explaining the law and the, the, sacri the law of sacrifice and the law of the conduct and, and goes into detail. But do you understand that those people had to obey and, and, and do those things day in and day out while they were in the desert. I mean, they had to prepare the sacrifice daily. Moving, I mean, taking apart the tabernacle and breaking camp. Now, they weren't just 25 guys out in the, you know, hunt, on a hunting trip. Hundreds of thousands of people out in the desert, they had to break camp and pack everything and, you know, and then travel and then set up camp and set up the, the tabernacle and continue with the sacrifices. And if, if you touched a dead thing, you know, whoops, you were unclean, then you had to go through the whole ceremony to become clean again. You had to wash, you had to go outside the camp, you had to offer sacrifice, you had to shave your beard, you had to do all kinds of stuff. And then that permitted you to do what? Well, to go back and then you know, offer the sacrifice. I mean, their whole life, there was no business no business practices, no interaction with other peoples, 
It was all about obeying God and carrying through the sacrifices. Then there was the Sabbath each week. All of this done to chip away 400 years of living in a pagan land and then mold the people into a godly nation. They will you know, wonder, why does it take so long? Well, you know, a whole generation had to die off before they were ready to enter into the, promise, the promised land. You, know, you, you get into bad habits. Imagine 400 years of bad habits. 400 years of you know, being influenced by idol worship and pagan living. All of that was chipped away a little at a time year after year, decade after decade, until they were ready to enter the promised land. So the point I'm making here is the work of breathing a godly image into our children is similar in approach. It takes time. On a daily basis, we mold them with rules and discipline according to biblical principles and morals. We speak the truth to them in love. We discipline uh, in fairness, not in anger. We affirm their individual personality and unique spiritual gifts. We encourage personal devotion and prayer. This is time consuming. It's time consuming and sometimes tedious, repeating the same things over. It's inconvenient. I mean, how, <laughs> there was a, a young mom here Wednesday, she was visiting. They've moved, you know, they've moved into this area, so she's kind of checking out the congregations in the area. And she was here on a Wednesday night with three children. <laughs> Not three teenagers who were themselves, you know, they can get themselves to church. Three, you know, one baby and a toddler and a five-year-old, something like that. You know, she, you know, a mom, with, she, had, she needed four arms to manage and her husband wasn't here, he was working, whatever. But the point was I, I greeted, hey, how's it going? Fine, you know, and she was wrangling these little kids. You know, I said, well, good for you, a Wednesday night you know, with three little kids. You know, and she she kind of shook her head and said, yeah, that's what it's like. Uh, yeah, <laughs> nothing easy about <laughs> bringing kids to church. At any time, never mind Wednesday, Sunday morning, one Sunday morning, once in a while, sure, every Sunday, every Sunday they come, what a chore. What an inconvenient chore. But it's all part of breathing that, you know, that godly life into them, to the point where being in church on a Sunday is like it's part of, it's part of life. It's like Christmas comes on December 25th every year. Well, every Sunday, you know, we, that's what we do, it's what our family does. And what happens when, the, when we, 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 we you know, instill that type of duty for worship, uh, habit for worship into them as they grow older, even if they, you know, as they grow into being teenagers and young adults maybe begin to drift away because they're, they're looking at other things, it never seems quite right if they're not in church on Sunday. <laughs> it never seems just quite, you know, I, I'm all by myself and I'm independent now and I'm paying my own way and I've got my own apartment and I've got my own car and I, you know, I see my folks every once in a while. So I'm, I'm the boss of me now, you know, but down deep inside, if, they're, you know, if it's 11 a.m., they're waking up on a Sunday you know, and they're thinking, I mean, you know, for, yeah, for the first 17 years, <laughs> I was at Sunday school every Sunday. That comes back to you. You ever wonder why people who have not come to church for I mean, for decades, and then all of a sudden something happens in their life, they begin to re-examine their life a little more closely, realize the thing that's missing in their life is a spiritual component when they examine things maybe that have not gone well, or even if their life has gone well, there's just something missing and they just finally realize the thing that's missing in my life is a spiritual component. And they come back, all of a sudden you say, oh, you know, if you've been here, like I've been here a long time in this congregation, you see somebody you haven't seen in 10, well, look at you, what are you doing here? Oh, you know, I just, always the same, it's always, I can almost write the script. I don't know, I just, it didn't feel right. I just decided, you know, it's time I got back to doing what I ought to be doing, to living the way I ought to be living. Really, how did you learn that? Well, my parents, you know, they, they ham, they carve that thing into me and it just won't go away. Responsibility of parents. 
But in a larger context, we also set markers that provide meaning and practice to their spirituality. It's not only you know, uh, building in them a, a spiritual life, we also provide markers. What I mean by marker, like regular attendance, that's a marker. Summer camp, <clears throat> summer camp doesn't sound like a lot. You know, camp, uh, uh, burning, uh, what is it? Burnt cabin, that's it. Uh, camp is coming up. And kids are going and it's always the same every year. The new kids, oh, I don't want to go. You know, I, I, I'm, you know, they're shy. They, oh, they don't think they're going to have fun. And then you, you know, parents kind of bear down a little and say, no, 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 no. It's not, I don't think I'm going. No, 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 you're going. I'm driving you, you're going to go, you know, period. And then the day that you go pick them up, the following Saturday, oh, I don't want to leave, I just made my best friend, and oh, you know, the, the counselor, I'm in love with the counselor. You know, I mean, they, it's always the same thing. Our kids, Camp Oma, imagine. Camp Oma in Montreal, Montreal where we live in, in Quebec, Camp Oma, the only Christian camp, was 350 miles away in Ontario. 300, not, not a half hour drive to, you know, or 40 minutes to, 350 miles. And they didn't have everybody in one week. They would have like the, you know, the grade school kids one week, that was their camp, then the following week would be middle school, then the following week would be high school, and then the following week or so would be uh, uh, family week. And Lee's, my wife, bless her soul, she would take the younger ones who were going to you know, the younger camp drive that 350 miles, drop them off, pack them in, everything, drive back home on the same day. 700 miles, one day. And then the following week, she would drive back to Oma, pick up the two young ones, drop off the two older ones for their camp, drive home. Drive back and pick up the older ones, drive home. And then two weeks later, everybody in the car, we all drive to Oma for our family week. You, you want to talk about inconvenience? <laughs> you want to talk about mileage on that van of ours, that baby blue van? Yet if you talk to our children today and ask, what are, what are some good memories? Oh, Oma, and I mean Oma, are you kidding me? You could see outside from inside. <laughs> the, the cabins, you know, and this is Canada, folks. This is not Oklahoma, this is Canada. It's, it's cold at night. The camps you know, were just a cabin. You could literally see through the, the wood to outside, just you know, steel bunk beds. That was it, nothing. No chairs, no tables, no nothing. Just bunk beds and, and, and old mattresses. And you brought your linen, you, you slept in those, in those cabins. But they, they loved it. They made friends that they still have today to this day that they met back in Oma. Oma is a marker. As a matter of fact, 20, 25 years later, there's even talk in our family, hey, let's all get together and let's all drive to Oma, which is what, 1,500 miles away now. Let's all drive to Oma for family week. Could you imagine the whole Mazzalongo clan, we're there for family week, you know? And grandpa said, <laughs> Yeah, you guys go to Oma, I'll be staying at the Holiday Inn, which is just a few miles from the camp. Youth rallies, activities. You know, what's amazing to me is we make our children eat their vegetables. Come on, you got to eat your peas or you got to eat your cauliflower, whatever it is. We make them eat them, but I don't want to. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if you want to or you don't want to. This is good for you. Eat the carrots, eat the peas. You know, you, every parent goes through that struggle, right? The moment the child finds out, oh, wait a minute, my parents really are, it's really in, important for them to meet, for, for me to eat the vegetable? You mean I've got something, I've got control over something? And the, the battle begins, right? And yet we won't, we won't have this battle if they say, nah, I don't feel like going to the youth rally. Nah, I don't feel like going to the youth camp. I don't feel like going to the youth day. But okay, dear, you get to choose. Why is it that we don't mind you know, exercising our parental authority for them to feed their bodies with good food, veggies, but we neglect sometimes to you know, exert our parental authority to make them eat their spiritual food. You know, for, for spiritual things, they get to decide. Who, who made that rule? We, we, we force them to do things that are good for them. What if your son said, you know what, I'm not into math, so I'm just going to not show up for the first session you know, in high school. I'll just come in an hour late because I don't like math. 
How, how would you react to that? Well, you know, that wouldn't fly in anybody's house. Well, same thing. If we take as important the spiritual feeding, the spiritual dis discipline that the children need, that we insist on those things. Remember, I'm talking about we, we create those family markers that somehow represent uh, spiritual living to them. Uh, family dinners at Christmas or Easter or Thanksgiving. Uh, a tradition uh, that perhaps, a spiritual tradition that is unique to your family and your circumstances. I remember in our family, at the time when all the kids were home and we were taking family vacations together, one of the traditions was that I would prep a devotional for every night that we were on vacation. Not a big long thing, but there was a, you know, a devotional that we would do in the evening when we, uh, we went swimming and we did the vacation. Then at night after supper, we'd do the Devo before we'd do watch TV, go to a movie, do something. And Lee's would create like a, ta a take home piece, a little souvenir piece based on the devotional that I, that I had presented to them. And there was no fighting about this. The kids saying, okay, it's time for the Devo. And we would do the Devo and that was the thing that we did. As a, as a family. I still have on my refrigerator some of those magnets you know, that Lee's made for those devos a long time ago. Um, we need to establish, the point I'm making here, spiritual habits and spiritual traditions that celebrate and constantly remind children that we are God's people. That's my point. This is who our family is. We're God's people. We're not ashamed of being God's people. We rejoice in being God's people. There's an advantage to being God's people. Usually it's these times that they remember best and we want them to remember them with, with joy. All right, breathing life into your children. So breathe image, breathe love, breathe image, breathe forgiveness, breathe forgiveness. Paul says in Colossians 3, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. In any family, this, should, this scripture here should be on the wall somewhere because there's a lot of forgiveness that needs to go on if you live family life. Forgiveness between mom and dad, forgiveness between brothers and sisters, forgiveness between dad and the kids and the kids and mom. You know, there's always forgiveness that's necessary. You can't live in any family without forgiveness. So we need to forgive our child as God has forgiven us. If we're teaching them correctly, we're teaching them that God is a God of mercy and to breathe the spirit of him into your child is to help him or her experience forgiveness. They will first experience forgiveness, either receiving it or giving it. The first time they'll experience that thing will be in their own home. If a child doesn't learn this key virtue, that child will have difficulty learning about God's mercy and will struggle with relationships all their life. Because learning how to forgive and how to ask for forgiveness is a primary virtue necessary to create a successful marriage, absolutely. The marriage counseling that I've done, that's usually the, one of the biggest problems. The couple comes in, they got, they've got legitimate complaints about one another, each of them. Where's the problem? They have no problem explaining the complaint. The problem is forgiving. <laughs> It, they don't know how to forgive. They don't know how to receive forgiveness. And usually it's because it was never taught to them in their own homes. So part of this training includes saying, I forgive you when they sin. If they disobey you, and I, I don't mean they're, they're, they're annoying their little sister. You know, I mean, you, you say to them, look, I forbid you, uh, you will not do this thing, whatever it is, for whatever, it's too dangerous or it's just not right, you won't do this. And they sneak around behind your back and they do it and get caught and are sorry. Uh, it's okay to say, well, this is the punishment, you're grounded for the weekend, whatever. That's just the punishment part. Where's the forgiveness part? 
See, if it's just the punishment part and we move on, there's no forgiveness there. This is where they learn about forgiveness. They learn about receiving, I'm sorry dad, I'm sorry mom. I forgive you, I forgive you. Let's try to do better next time. Also, let's, let's not hold on to their past wrongs. A lot of time parents, yeah, I forgive you, and it moves on, and two days later, they're kids, remember, they're kids. They do the same dumb thing. Or sometimes three months later, they do the same dumb thing. And sometimes parents, well, there you go again, you know, and throw it right back into, you know, if you forgave, then you can't go back and you know, dig up the old stuff and just slam them with it. You can refer to it, but you can't use it as a stick to beat them with. Parents are the ones that need to model saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me. That's where they learn that. That doesn't come naturally to themselves. I remember once in the house, I forget why, just, anyways, I was in a bad mood for some reason or other, and I got angry and I kicked the chair. I just, and I kicked the chair and I cursed. I used the bad word, right, Julia? I used the bad word. I used the, I used the word that has four letters in it. It was terrible of me to do that. And Julia was there. And all of a sudden, I, the minute, you know, you dads know, the minute it came out of my mouth, I went, oh man, you just, you just, you know, you just lost it, son, you know, talking to myself. And Julia, I could hear Julia running through the house, mommy, mommy, daddy said a bad word, mommy, every, hear ye, hear ye, you know. <laughs> I was done. But I remember, I remember bringing the kids together. I remember, first of all, apologizing to Lise. That was wrong, I'm sorry, please forgive me. But I remember saying it to the children as well. What daddy said, that was wrong. That was uncalled for, there's no reason for it. It is a bad word and I'm going to try harder in the future to avoid saying that when I'm angry. And I'm going to even try to not be angry so easily. Where will they learn that? They're not going to learn that from the superheroes that they watch on TV. They're not going to learn that from cool Minecraft or something. They're going to learn that from you. Parents, grandparents. And listen to their angry feelings. Don't get angry because they're angry. That was what, how it used to be in my house. I don't mean my house with my children, but that was the way it was in my house with my parents. If I was angry at some about something, whether it was at school or my best buddy you know, has now found a new best buddy you know, and I was angry, the response was, you must not be angry in this house. Anger will not be tolerated in this house. <laughs> so what do you do with anger if it's not tolerated? Well, you just swallow it, right? You swallow it and you keep swallowing it and you keep repressing it. Well, what happens one day? Well, you have ulcers when you're 21 years old. That's what happens. <laughs> Listen to their angry feeling. Listen, what are you saying? I hear you shout and I hear you're mad, but tell me, okay, what's going on? And discuss with them biblical examples of forgiveness. You want to do a devo with your kids? Oh, I don't know where, where would I start? You know? Start with the, the, uh, the parable of the prodigal son. Every child will understand the, 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 the parable of the prodigal son. It's a wonderful teaching opportunity. Explain the process if there is time. You know, when there's a crisis in a child's life, that crisis obviously creates tension and creates angst in them. But that crisis also produces a teachable moment, a moment where you can imprint on them some important lesson. That's what a teachable moment is, a time where you can imprint on them an important lesson. So if, the, if, if there's a moment of crisis, if the only thing that they get out of you at, at, a, at a teachable moment is yelling, or your anger, <laughs> what have they learned? Well, they learned to respond to those kind of moments with anger and other negative responses. 
train them in the process of forgiveness. Here's the process of forgiveness. I could do another 40 minutes just on this, but we don't have time, but at least I'll give you the slide. What is the process of forgiveness? It's not just saying, I forgive you. There's a process. First, you talk it out. What happened? The brother and sister. Well, you know, I lent her my th whatever it was, and, and she said, uh, and then she broke it. And then I got mad and I hit her. Okay. Oh, what, what, well, I had it and I didn't, I, you know, I was going to give it back to him, but I didn't do it on purpose. You know, it wasn't like I went out and just broke it on purpose. I, I just left it there and then it slipped and fell and it broke. Talk it out. Accept responsibility. All right, you know, I, I'll replace it. I, you know, I, you know, my next four allowances, I'm going to put them aside and I'll, I'll try to replace it. Ask for forgiveness. I'm sorry, I didn't do it on purpose. I know it was your favorite thing and you lent it to me and, I, and it's broken now, so I'm, I'm sorry for that. I didn't mean to do that, but I'm sorry that, that it broke. The other side. Okay, well, I'm not happy, but I forgive you. I, I realize you didn't do it on purpose. Receiving forgiveness. Thank you. Reconciliation. Are we friends again? Are we okay? Yes. Renewal. Let's go outside and play. There's a process. They have to learn the process if they're going to be able to, to use it. And believe it or not, this process is exactly the same for adults, countries, you know, nations that are at war, this is exactly the same process, exactly the same steps for every type of conflict. The thing about children is they have a more innocent heart, so they're more willing, if they're coached, to kind of learn it. It gets more difficult as you become adults because pride gets in the way and, you know, and all those kind of things get in the way. And for countries, even more difficult. But this is always the same, same thing. God's ultimate purpose in bringing Christ to earth was to offer forgiveness. A child who is not schooled in the meaning and experience of giving and receiving forgiveness is incomplete spiritually. So here's the you know, breathing life into our children. We breathe love. We breathe identity. In other words, we form the identity of Christ in them. We teach them about forgiveness because that's, that's such an important tool in the box, in the toolbox of life, learning how to ask and, and give forgiveness. And then the fourth one, breathe enthusiasm. So the fourth element necessary in breathing spiritual life into your child is enthusiasm, what the Bible calls joy. Now the English word enthusiasm comes from the Greek word ethnos which literally means in God, in God. The vitality of God in your soul, it's that spiritual element that enables a person to work hard and persevere and overcome obstacles in the service to his or her faith. It's what Nehemiah had as he led the Israelites in the hard and dangerous and discouraging work of rebuilding the wall, for example, in Jerusalem, what did he say to them? He said, go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And then Paul says to the church, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice, Philippians 4.4. Enthusiasm and joy is the pleasure we experience when our hearts are in tune with the Lord. In other words, you know that feeling you get when you've done the right thing in a difficult situation, that, uh, that exhilaration that you begin to feel? It was a hard decision, but I did the right thing despite all the, I did the right thing. That thing you feel there, that's, that's joy. That's joy. Children must see and learn that their faith is the cause and the source of joy in their lives, not simply rules, laws, restrictions, and certainly not money and things. 
Some people, the only religious training that so many people receive when they're young are only about rules, the law. It's as if we teach our children only the law, uh, only the Old Testament. We teach them only, if you sin, you die. You know, it's the only law they know. And we don't move on to the New Testament <laughs> where God forgives us of sin and we live in grace. Again, there are practical ways parents can cultivate the spiritual environment around and in their children so they can actually feel the enthusiasm produced directly by their faith. In other words, we have to show children that something good comes about because of our faith. If the only thing they see about our faith is, oh no, you can't do that, that's wrong. Well, uh, what kind of God is that? They have to also see joy and happiness and strength and satisfaction because of faith for them to want to pursue faith when they leave home. So how do we do this? A couple of ideas, lots of ideas. Model enthusiastic faith and service. There's a component of joy that is essentially viral. You catch it from somebody else. If there's no enthusiasm for spiritual things coming from parents, there won't be any for the children either. They catch it from you. They catch it from you. B, encourage Christian friendship. As children grow, a lot of their behavior and attitudes will be influenced by their friends. While you can, breathe into their lives every opportunity for them to bond with other Christians. You know, church activities, camps, rallies, school, Christian hospitality of other Christians. If the only people that are ever in your house are non-Christians, well, how are they going to learn about Christian hospitality? And let your children know that you expect them to marry a Christian one day. That was always the expectation in our home. We can't, as parents, we can't control that. We can't control that. You know, I, I, I've said to our children, uh, I don't get a vote on who, who you marry. I don't get a vote on that. Only one person votes for that, that's you. You, you, have, you have the vote on who you marry, but I have an opinion. You don't need, and another thing, I used to tell them, you don't need my permission to marry so and so. You don't need my permission. We're not living in the Middle Ages here. So you don't need my permission to marry whoever you want, but you may want my blessing. You may want my blessing. And if you want my blessing, then here's who I want you to marry. Now you can, you know, you can set that aside if you want. It's your right, it's your privilege. Number three, include them in ministry. Just like you encourage them to help you, you know, bake a cake or build a birdhouse using grown-up tools and equipment. Let them know the joy that comes from working alongside you in ministry. You're going to go visit somebody sick in the hospital, a friend, somebody in church, bring the kid along. Let them see. You're going to clean the church on a Saturday, you know, you're bring the kids along, get them to participate. You're preparing a baby shower, you're going to decorate, put up balloons and things like that for a baby shower. Bring, bring somebody along, let them see what you're doing. Nothing bonds parent and child more in the spirit and joy of Christ than serving together in His name. Oh, if you don't remember anything, please, this next thing. A child who equates spirituality with joy will be inoculated against the counterfeit happiness promised by the sinful pleasures of this world. If they know that happiness and joy, the source of it is Christ, and the working out of it is ministry, you'll have protected them against the evil one in this world who will say, no, 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 here's where the joy is. You know, illicit sex and drugs and worldliness and uh, you know, chasing after money and uh, having stuff, you know, that's where the joy is. If you teach them early where joy comes from, they won't be subject to that type of temptation. 
So what we're aiming to do as parents is to have our children internalize the image of God that we are modeling to them and teaching them. William Gaultier puts it this way in his book. As parents, we want to try to pass on the love, identity, forgiveness, and enthusiasm of God to our children so they can internalize it for themselves and then share it with others. This spiritualization will affect how they see themselves. They will see themselves as forgiven, as loving, as godly, as joyful people, and how they will see and treat others which will prepare them to breathe God's life into their children one day, and those will be your grandchildren. Those will be your grandchildren. So you, know, you do the pick and shovel work now, you have a better chance of you know, having the joy of seeing your own grandchildren embracing the faith. Okay, but there's so much to be said. One lesson is not much, but some, some large ideas. All right, next week, preparing for teen parenting. <laughs> yeah, get ready. <laughs> Buckle in. <laughs> We're going to do a couple of lessons about you know, teens, tweens, and, and teen parenting. All right, we'll see you next week. <laughs>